This class is going to focus on nationalism. What's good about it? What's not so good about it? Many politicians, schools, media, they all promote the idea of celebrating nationalism as the best thing since sliced bread, but it's not that simple. Of course, we need to define what nationalism is before we go any further. First off, most people usually think the word nation means a country. And that's quite often how we use it, but that's actually a nation state. Let me explain the difference. A nation is a group of people who feel unified for a variety of reasons that make them distinct from others. We're going to go into more detail about those reasons in a minute. A nation state is the internationally recognized political and geographic boundaries that define that nation, a country. So you can have nations within a nation state. For example, here in Canada, we have First Nations, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada that comprise of many different nations. They have a feeling of unity that makes them distinct from other Canadians, but they don't have their own nation state. That's a controversial topic we're going to talk about much later in the course. The organization of people into nations can be very beneficial because people like to be around others that have similar values. It makes them feel secure and have a sense of belonging. Think about who you hang out with and who you don't hang out with. Why is that? Growing up, I didn't hang out with my parents' friends, or my parents if I could help it. That's because I didn't feel like we had the same interests. But of course, my interests changed over time, and now I quite enjoy the company of my parents and their friends. I've also had situations in my life where I felt like an outsider. Recently, I took a trip to Spain and only knew what I call Dora Spanish. Hola, por favor. Because of this, I couldn't talk to many people, and I felt really isolated. I was very happy when I found someone who also spoke English, because then we had something in common, language. So that takes me to the factors or characteristics that help to create or unify a nation of people. Language is a big part of it. Obviously, you're not going to have as much in common with people that you can't communicate with. But it's even more than that. Language allows us to share ideas and make connections. The words we use to describe things are also how we interpret our world. So while por favor is often translated as please into English, it's really asking for a favor. Por favor. The most obvious example of a linguistic nation within Canada would be the Francophones. Another understanding or characteristic of a nation could be ethnicity, usually looked at in terms of physical features, your race. In many large cities in North America, there's a Chinatown. That's because some people want to live near others who have the same racial characteristics, ethnicity, language, history, culture. It's more comfortable and can be easier to communicate with people who have a better understanding of where you're coming from. Culture is another factor that links people together. Culture includes the acceptable ways to act, our norms. For example, ceremonies like weddings and funerals in other countries can be very different from most of the weddings and funerals held here in Canada. Culture also includes the ways of life we share, like the food we eat, the literature we enjoy, and the type of entertainment we're attracted to. And it can be intertwined with ethnicity, language, and history. For example, in central Alberta, there's a strong Ukrainian community that has traditional dances, foods, and a shared history that helps to unite them. Next is geography. Where you live can influence a nation, especially if that land isolates you. The Basque in the mountains of northern Spain, or the Tibetans in the Himalayas, both have a unique culture that developed because of their relative isolation. Even man-made borders can unify a people. I belong to the nation of Canadians, and my cousins belong to the nation of Americans, even though what really separates us is a border some guys drew on a map. Okay, there's more to it, but I'm trying to make a point about geography here. The relationship to the land can also influence a nation because of the resources available. The climate, we Canadians survive tough winters. Or the ability to attract others, like tourists because of the beauty of the land. That can influence your national pride. Our mountain parks are a great example of that. The mountains also play an important role for many local First Nations groups as they have a spiritual connection to them. This is another factor that can unify people, having similar spiritual or religious values. Agreeing on the meaning of life and individual potential can create a bond between people. For example, there's many people in the world who are Muslim and could have a national loyalty to other people who are also Muslim. They don't have a specific nation state they must live in, but they still have a connection to each other through their religious belief. So let me give you an example that can demonstrate all of these factors, the nation state of Israel. This country was created in 1948 in order to provide a homeland for Jewish people. The history of Israel actually goes way back, like seriously, several thousand years. The people of Israel conquered the territory in about 1200 BC, then they got conquered, then regained control, only to be conquered again. Finally, in about 70 AD, the Romans, who were the current conquerors, destroyed their cities and kicked them out for good. This is known as the Diaspora, and many of the Israelites ended up in Eastern Europe. They were often discriminated against, and so they lived in closed communities. 
But then these communities were vulnerable to attacks, especially in Russia. These attacks were known as pogroms. By the 1900s, many Jewish people were trying to move back to their homeland, but there's a problem. They haven't lived there for almost 2,000 years, and the Palestinian people who are there now aren't so happy about these newcomers, as there are religious, cultural, and ethnic differences. It's really complicated. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but let's just say things were not good in this tiny region of the world. Then World War II happens, and the Holocaust shocks the world. We realize that if the Jewish people do not have a nation-state that is sovereign, they might always feel threatened. So the United Nations created the nation-state of Israel. So who gets to live there? Well, you gain automatic citizenship when you move to Israel if you can demonstrate that ethnically you are Jewish, that you are a descendant of the people of Israel. So both the nation and the nation-state have a strong basis in ethnicity. The people of Israel are also unified by the geography of the land. Their long history can be identified with the land formations they see in the region. They have a common language, Hebrew, and a common religion, Judaism, although the ways in which they practice this religion differs among the citizens, with some being more orthodox or strict than others. So you can see that the nation and the nation-state of Israel are unified because of the many understandings of nationalism. Okay, so we've talked about how nationalism can help to unify people because it leads them to pursue common goals, getting things accomplished by working together. But this feeling of unity can also divide people by creating a feeling of us versus them, that there are insiders and outsiders. This can lead to scapegoating when you blame someone else for your problems. We often see this in countries that are experiencing a recession when the economy is not doing well. Oh, it must be the immigrants' fault. Hopefully you remember your lessons on the importance of immigration to Canada. Nationalism can lead to corrupt governments who ensure that the members of their nation within the nation state get the best jobs and resources. We call this tribalism. When nationalism is taken to extremes, it can create terrible violence. We're going to look at ultra-nationalist ideas. When nationalism leads to violence and war, whether to break away or to expel others from a country. But we'll look at that in a later unit. Let's go back to that example of Israel. We can see the conflict created by nationalism because there's been an ongoing battle between the two major nations, the Israelis who are Jewish and the Palestinians who are Muslim. But it's much more than religion that divides these two groups. First off, both groups claim the rights to the land because of an ancient prophet named Abraham stating that this was the promised land for his descendants, and both the Palestinians and the Israelis claim that inheritance through two different sons. The Palestinians were not happy that the UN imposed this new nation-state on them, and they waged several wars with other Arab allies to try and regain control of the area. But Israel often won the wars and gained more territory as a result. This has increased the conflict between the Arab and Jewish nations in the region. Most Palestinians in the region live in refugee camps, with the Israeli government severely controlling their lives. In the last few decades, Palestinian extremist groups have resorted to terrorism in order to fight the control of the Israelis, and sadly, it usually results in even more control and a high death toll when the Israelis retaliate against this terrorism. And both sides demand that the other nation states around the world must pick sides. If you aren't with us, then you must be against us, and this creates a global tension that often flares up, impacting politics and economics around the world. But wait, there's one more factor I haven't talked about yet that influences a nation to feel unified. That's civic nationalism. If you think about Canada, we really don't have a lot that unifies us. We don't all speak the same language. Our geography is about as varied as you could get since we're so ginormous. More Canadians are saying that they don't have a connection to a specific religion. We don't even have the same history. Aboriginal peoples, Francophones, Anglophones, and immigrants might see the same event from a very different perspective. And of course, we celebrate and promote multiculturalism, so we don't share the same ethnicity or culture. So what does unify us? It's our willingness to share common values and live under the same laws. It's a political unity, civic nationalism. Of course, all nation states have some degree of civic nationalism because no nation state has only one culture or ethnicity. But Canada understands that what holds us together is our agreement to respect the laws and to respect each other. Okay. In our next lesson, we're going to talk more about how nationalism can relate to your identity.